Dr. Blake, thank you so much for joining the Women of New York podcast. We're grateful to have you and are looking forward to hearing and learning more about you and your vast experience in fight for equality. Um, would you mind introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about you? Yes. Well, let me say thank you for inviting me to join you. You're talking about some of my favorite topics. Um, well, I'll start with my family. I am wife to Professor James Blake for 57 years this coming June. I have four children. I have seven grandchildren. I'm an educator. Uh, I am friend. I'm an author. I love to write. <laughs> I have two books that are out and I'm working on my third, which is at the publisher now. Um, and something about my education, my early education. I started my education in a one-room schoolhouse on a sharecropper plantation where my family, my mother and my sister and brother, we fled like slaves in the middle of the night. <laughs> then I continued my schooling, my public schooling uh, in Louisiana. And from elementary school to the time that I got my doctorate at Columbia and my uh, postdoctoral study at Harvard, I studied at all uh, So that's a little bit about my, my background. And in that process, in that educational journey, in the struggle, um, against racism and, and sexism and you know all the things that we encounter women were always at the center they were the ones who lifted me and kept me moving forward so I, i'm grateful to be able to to have this conversation with you about women and if, if i could mention a few of them uh, please Teachers were an important group of women. And one that comes to mind is Sister Lucille Anderson, who was my first public school teacher um, on the plantation. And she was a very compassionate woman. She was the one who arranged to have a, a car come and get my family in the middle of the night and take us to my first. Uh, urban school, uh, Southern Town. And then there were church women once I was in Louisiana who had a great impact. Um, I'm thinking about my Sunday school teachers. They couldn't read or write, but they taught me to um, listen more carefully and I learned reading comprehension. From them. And then in the black colleges, you know, I know there's a lot of focus on black colleges now with the new vice president. There was Anthenia J. Bates. She looked like she came out of the middle ages. She used to dab her little top of her lip with a, a hanky. And, and she would say, well, Miss Waits, you know, and she seemed so, um, gentle and the, the 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 time the semester that i was due to graduate she called me into a classroom said she wanted to meet and i wondered well why aren't we meeting in her office she said that uh well it's not what she said it's what she did all the professors were there and i felt like i was on trial and that's how they kind of like forced me into uh, going to graduate school because I thought if I didn't sign that paper for a fellowship to graduate school, then they weren't gonna let me graduate for my baccalaureate degree. So th that's just a little bit about my educational journey. That's an incredible journey. <laughs> Truly, I I'm, I'm amazed by you. I'm sure yeah. Cecilia is as well. Cecilia, do you want to just introduce yourself and, and tell us a little bit about your role at the Women, um, the Center for the Women of New York? Yes. 
Uh, good evening, Dr. Blake. We're, um, I want to second what Kathy said. We're very, we're, it's a great honor to have you uh, tonight with us. Thank you so much for joining us and for letting us, uh, for sharing uh, your story with you. Um, I am um, the Vice President of the Center for the Women of New York, and we like honor and um, we honor women like you and we like to bring people like you to inspire other women to help women who need help like you needed help from those amazing teachers women um, in my life <laughs> uh, thank you thank you for sharing your story it's so valuable to us and in february which is like on black month history but always like this interview will treasure forever every month every year we strongly well, believe that Black history doesn't just happen in the shortest right. part of the year, Dr. Blake. And we have made it a point to live and breathe Black history always. That's in our core of who we are. That's in our DNA. And we know that that's a large part of the um, Center for Women of New York's mission is equality. And a lot of that is making sure that we're leveling the playing fields for everybody. That's wonderful. <laughs> Um, if I may ask you um, the next the next question, Ms. Uh, Dr. Blake, um, you wrote three books. And in the first book uh, you published, uh, speak the uh, speak to the mountain. You write about your mother and her life in the deep south during and after the depression, and you did talk a little bit about that. Uh, could you tell us about her determination to overcome the many challenges she faced? And the role of her determine the, the role that her determination played in the decisions you made regarding educating and empowering other women. Yes. Well, my mom's. Uh, well, first of all, let me say that she was a phenomenal woman, and she was my my first teacher. She taught me to read in her bedroom before I started to school. She was my best friend and she was my confidant. So um, I kind of feel all that I am is just, you know, from mom. She's a very special person. But, but her struggles and her determination stems from memories of the Great Depression. She was born in 1925. She lost her mother when she was three years old. And um, the depression came early to, to black families. And, and uh, my mom was raised by her father who was a really gentle man and, and a loving man, a farmer and an artist, but he didn't know how to run a house and he didn't know how to smooth the rough edges um, of not having a woman in the house and living through the depression. You know, there was a drought, there was food scarcity. Uh, it makes me think a little bit about what we're going through today. But thank God there were two women. <laughs> One was Miss Olia. She was the, the, the nearest neighbor was a white woman. And she, she had my mother come over a couple of times a week to get butter and buttermilk and taught her to make a little bread. She was just a, a, a very kind woman. And the other woman who um, helped them with hunger was Miss Emma, a school teacher who started cooking classes so that the children could take some food home. Um, so that was her background and, and her determination stems from those rough times and she vowed that her children would not suffer as she did during her childhood. So um, how did that transfer to me? Well, I was a mama's girl, as you probably have already gathered. And I was also, she described me as an observant 
child. I would study her. And uh, as a matter of fact, I was the one who begged her, Mama, come to school because our teacher is kind. And, and, and I know she'll help us. I knew my mother was in a bad situation because my father had sort of walked off and, and left us on a plantation. And she was there with three children. And sometimes I would catch her crying when she didn't know I was watching. So I was always on the lookout. And when we got to the city, Mama worked as a domestic and she went to night school and finished the last two years of high school. Uh, she was raising four, well, well, it was five of us, I'm counting my siblings as four, but anyway, she, she was raising five children and she was contending with uh, an alcoholic husband who returned from World War II, a shell of a man. Uh, how, uh, you know, how she did that is just amazing. But uh, she didn't stop there. I was, I was really impressed that she, after, despite all she was doing, she enrolled as a member of the first class of black nurses in Louisiana. And uh, I watched her study and I learned from her. I said, oh, if mama can do all this and make things better for her, for us, then I can study hard and make things better for mama. And so I got my determination from her by her example. Then she, she had a boldness about her. She, when she got her nursing license, was, first of all, she made the high school in nursing. And when she got the license, she had the courage to go in and work during the polio epidemic. When everyone was saying, ooh, you better be careful. You're gonna, cause people didn't understand polio the way they don't understand COVID now. And so everybody was trying to put fear in her and saying, you know, you're going to bring that home to your children. But she would say, well, God is protecting me. And she went in. And as I grew up, I was saying, gosh, she's studying. I mean, she's working in this polio epidemic and um, under the banner in a hospital that's named Confederate Memorial. <laughs> so so it, it was that kind of inspiration that I got from her example. In addition to that, she would tell me, Bessie, you better get some grit in your craw. You're not a poor little weakling. <laughs> and she would tell me about studying and, um, you know, but the thing that stuck with me among other things was she said, look, do not be a copy, be yourself. Be the best original person you can be. And so it was that kind of determination that got me involved with uh, women. Uh, I was dean at the College of Rochelle. I worked in that job for a number of years but I saw it more as a mission or a calling than a job because it was, the College of New Rochelle was a historically woman's college. And in the first co-ed school where I was dean, there, it was, it was, there were 95% of the students were women. And of the women, 85% <laughs> were in New York City proper. And it was, there were long hours. It was an exciting program. It was innovative. But what I really um, remember most, and, and, and it, which is what I, I, I'm most pleased about, is that more than 10,000 women got their 
a baccalaureate degree under my leadership at the college. And I couldn't help thinking about my mom and that those women would have the impact on their children as they watch them study that my mom had on me. I'm sorry, I know I'm talking a lot, but it's my mom. <laughs> You never have to apologize. I almost teared up listening to you speak about your mom because mm -hmm. I am too a mama's girl. And, yes. <laughs> and I, I mean, Cecilia's here, so it's a little weird to geek out about her, but I just think moms are such special humans yes. that love and beyond yes. for their little ones. And they find strength where you feel like you have nothing else to give, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'm inspired. I mean, I think if yeah, I whenever I get the chance, you know, that'd be the greatest role I, I have. <laughs> yeah. I will I will listen to you like for hours and hours uh, talk about your mom. So absolutely <laughs> do not apologize. I, yeah. I'm telling you, I almost teared up and, and because we are talking about mothers, you know, in the second book you published, God's Bad Boy, you, you also yeah. write about your husband's story and a turning point in his life with his mother and from that, you know, you, you go into the topic of the public issue of broken families, as your husband, Professor James Blake, refers to it. Do you mind just telling us a little bit about that, Dr. Blake? Yeah. Well, let me say he's not really a bad boy. <laughs> uh, he was labeled a bad boy, as so many, you know, uh, young men of color are because of the suffering and the things that they're going through. Uh, maybe I should start with, you know, the circumstances of his mother, his, the family being shattered. Um, they called him Little Jimmy. <laughs> and Little Jimmy was out playing with uh, the other boys um, out on a vacant lot. And someone said, Little Jimmy, Ain't that your mama? And he looked up and saw his mother leap from a second floor window. And half the community chased behind her as she raced toward Flesh and Bay. And you can imagine the trauma that that was for him. And, and uh, so as traumatic as it was, the trauma for the family didn't start on that day. It started on the great migration of uh, African Americans in the 1930s from the, the, the hot cotton and tobacco fields of the South. And Jimmy's mother was the first to migrate to New York from South Carolina. And one by one, she brought all her family members up, her mother, her sister, and four brothers. And they crammed into her flushing apartment with um, her husband, Joe, and four children. So it was, it was quite a, a, a way to begin, you know. Um, the time in New York. She was smart. She was considered a scholar, as a matter of fact, because when she came to New York in the 1930s, to have a ninth grade education was, was pretty rare um, in people who had been so-called field hands. And, but, the, but the rest of the family members, none of them could read or write. So it fell to her to fill out job applications. Uh, if someone went for a job interview to work in a factory, she had to take them herself because they couldn't read the subway and the bus signs. Um, she, they, they weren't that successful in getting jobs. So the men mostly did, uh, I don't know if you know what, those uh, flat fix curbside places where you can get your flat fix. They did jobs like that and they became what were called gypsy cab drivers. And she kept the books. Well, doing all of that while trying to raise four children, 
uh, led to a nervous breakdown that shattered the family. So that, that's where everything started. So the, the public issues that followed, Jimmy used to say, take it personally, like, you know, why did this happen to my family? And it was a very long time before he realized that there were many other families in the same circumstances. He certainly didn't realize it during his childhood, which he spent in um, children's homes with the uh, two siblings left in Corona Queens to kind of fare for themselves. And uh, one sister went to a children's home and then the younger sister went to a foster home. But he spent from age nine until he went away to college, you know, uh, away from his family. So that, that was a, a very difficult thing for him. And so he just, he just kind of took that as um, this happened to me. And then he went to graduate school and realized, oh, there are lots of families. And so from that, he was determined to work with young people and he still does that today. And he is really terrific at helping uh, young people who are so-called at risk. And many of them are at risk. So that's the God's bad boy. I call him God's bad boy because in his devotion to helping youth, he takes, he, he is very effective in carrying out the mission that religious institutions should be carrying out. And once he sees a child in need, he will not let go. And people say, he's a troublemaker or he's a bad boy. And so I said, yeah, you're bad, but you're God's bad boy. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. That's a, it's so inspiring to see how all the sacrifice, all the trauma was not in vain. And although it's heartbreaking to hear the difficulties and like extreme challenges your mom and, and, and your, your husband's mom went through, you're both, you're both inspired by what they did and what they convey like the message that they gave you and, and you carried on their legacy you continue it and you you will live forever and we owe you and people like you um you know the advancement of uh, social justice and equality so um thanks to yeah. your mom and, and mother-in-law uh, yeah. for that can i can i just say it um about public issues, I want to say they're the same as they are today. And just in memory of my mother-in-law, it was, for him, it, it, there was cruel and in, in, inhumane treatment of the mentally ill. And since the 50s, we haven't come very far. So the public policy issues are much like those that existed in the 50s. The, 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 there was the dealing with unemployment, um, it, ineffective social services and, so, and sometimes misdirected social services. I remember the, the, the social workers who used to come around to check on his household and his family were mostly interested in whether there were wh whether the father or a man was in the house, and they were always chasing the men away. And today, I think the instrument that's used is the uh, child support. And I know women need, you know, men to be responsible in terms of of child care, but that so-called deadbeat dad law was initiated around a case of a cases of 
men who were well off and just wouldn't take care of their family. But what we have now is harassment from the courts of men who are unemployable because they have a poor education, they don't have the skills, and then you throw them in jail for the lack of child support. So it, it, it we does have a, a lot to do in terms a of lot more policy. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and I, again, like I thank you and your husband for, for advocating for social issues and to, like, for helping youth and trying to break that cycle that's so hard to break and we haven't been able to, to change for, for good, change as much as we should have. Yes. Ceci, so, can I ask one thing? Because you brought this up, Dr. Blake, and, and you bring up the issues that are still prevalent today and the injustice, you know, and the systems that are in place against people reaching equality, right? But the other issue that you bring up is mental health. And this is an issue that's not often brought up. And right now we're undergoing a she session, right? Where it's women are disproportionately leaving the workplace because of that burden, right? The one yeah. that brought um, your husband's mother to a breakdown. It's the expectancy and the demand to be both a caretaker and also um, a leader in all these other spaces. And, and mm -hmm. typically women take these roles of initiative. You know, you've seen it with your mother. You brought it up in very detailed fashion. You, you, you've listed the examples of what led to that breakdown, which I thought was really important. It wasn't just something out of context. It was the, the leading points into that. And it's happening now more than ever. And yeah. we're reverting to a time that in, in decades we've, we've tried to overturn in just the last couple of years, in, in just the last year with this pandemic. Can you speak a little bit on your thoughts there, if that's appropriate? I know we hadn't thought about, about this the, long time. The, about the pandemic and mental stress. Yeah, and just like yeah. that, the, 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 the weight that is placed on the shoulders of yes. so many. Yeah, mothers. yeah, yeah, we, we are, for women, we, we are, it seems we're to be all things to all people. And I mean, it's it's uh, we can't we can't do it. And and I'm glad for uh, an organization like the Center for Women of New York because we can come together. And in the things that I faced, and and my mom, is is there has always been. Um, a circle of women who support one another, and and the services that are, uh, that we provide to one another are critical because when the pressure gets too much and one woman falls, ultimately it falls to another woman. I mean, my husband and I are still helping both young people and uh, older people who are feeling the stress of the pandemic. He has a a, a ninety year old aunt who is living alone, and uh, we can't get there as often as we would like. But I make sure I call her every day. It's the little things that we do to touch one another. And then he has a, a niece who lives in Brooklyn who needs that kind of care. Now, his aunt is sharp as a tack. <laughs> I hope I have her mental alertment, you know, in a few years when, I, when I'm her age. But we have to care for one another. And if we don't learn, well, all of these things that we go through, I, I think we should, every experience, there's something to be learned. And one of the things that we can learn from the pandemic is just to slow down, listen to one another, care for one another. It's, it's not always the big things you do, it's the small things, you know, reaching out, you know. So anyway, I, I don't know if I addressed your question, but those are the things that are on my heart about this and, and mental stress. <laughs> you did. That was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Blake. Absolutely. I, um, 
that's what uh, my, my kids keep asking me. What? So why did this pandemic happen? And in trying to find the silver line, and uh, I I say that that we have to we have to appreciate mm-hmm. small things and listen yeah. to one another. And we were just getting lost in in not doing that. And our priorities need to go back to what is important, and yeah. that's what's important. Yeah. And um. And I, I just, I just want to touch on like what you said about your mom bringing one by one everyone from from the south. Um, my mom just joined us, just joined our families, and one of the reasons was that like the the mental health issue and and how being lonely. So I, I really appreciate what you said. And, and you know the horrible thing is from a, a public policy perspective, and 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 and. There are some people who are progressive and who understand, but there are so many people who don't understand mental illness. They're frightened by it. Um, I was visiting um, a family member of a young woman in the family who had had a, a, a nervous breakdown. And the nurse was so concerned about, well, uh, does she do drugs? Uh, well, does she hang out? Does she drink? Uh, it was like she was doing a checklist in her head to say, well, how did she bring this on herself? And then when she had satisfied, this, this was nothing like the health checklist, but when she had satisfied herself, then she said, oh, okay, thank you, because she did the little checklist, and she said, okay, I'm not vulnerable to this. So some people are frightened by the prospect of it, but others are just callous, you know, and the biggest um, mental health provider now seems to be the, uh, the courts and, and policemen. You know, if there's a mental health, it, you, you see it in the news, all the mental health situations that go wrong because the, the people are not equipped to deal with it. And so many people, the, the, the hospitals, they, they have um, done away with, which was a good thing. And they tried small group homes, which work sometimes. But the big place, the place that a mentally ill person is more likely to end up is on the street or incarcerated. That, that's a sad commentary. It is, it is. Um, all the, we need like, a little Rosa Parks by now, don't we? <laughs> yes, that, that's my uh, that that's my next question. However, like this is so interesting and so relevant today. Yeah. yeah. And like the one thing in my mind, like talking about the public issue, and we're talking about you know Black history, and like how like it does come to my mind, and I think it's worth mentioning before we go to uh, the very important question of Rosa Parks um, that this pandemic has affected um, Black families um, so much more, and Black and Brown, I, I would say, uh, yes. than, than other communities. So I, 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 I couldn't just transfer to the next question without just mentioning that. Yes, it has. Yes, it has. And if, if uh, Rosa Parks was, were here, she mm-hmm. would be out volunteering somewhere. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, like no doubt that she would so um two years ago (laughs) my um you you did a presentation in um in an elementary public school where your grandchildren attended and i learned about you through my third grader at the time she told me how inspiring your presentation was um when you talked about what you did uh with rosa parks um, so I would love for you to share some of what you spoke about uh, that inspired my daughter as well as many other uh, young kids. Well, I wanted to start by saying I love Rosa Parks. <laughs> we have so much in common. 
Um, I like her because she's made all our lives better. And uh, I, I feel a kindred spirit with her because um, my earliest days was started, I was on a bus in Alabama of all places, which is her home state. And uh, uh, I was, my mother was taking me to see my father before he was shipped off to World War II. And it, there was a, a racial incident that forced, the, the incident was, I was crying because it was, it was hot on the bus. And my mother got off in the middle of nowhere at, you know, when, when night was falling because she thought that they might um, kill me. She had read where they had crashed some woman's baby against the bus because the baby wouldn't keep quiet. So that's my early, early bus incident. <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I love her because she loves children, because she has courage, because she has uh, determination and devotion to a cause and she just stuck with it for so many years. Her activism started in the 30s and went through the 90s and so I just have a great deal of, of love and respect and I'm fortunate now to say that I have 25 years of friendship with Rosa, Rosa Parks. Uh, and I'm still with her because I worked on her official um, eulogy and I ironed the dress that she wore, <laughs> that she's wearing right now. So I love Rosa Parks, but I met her and her executive assistant, Elaine Steele, uh, at the College of New Rochelle when they came, when Mrs. Fox was awarded an honorary degree, I asked my husband to pick them up at the airport and uh, be, because it's a very, it was a very busy time for me, there were I think about 600 women graduating that year and I had to call all of them by name. So he went out to LaGuardia Airport and he had a single rose and he waited for her, roses for Rosa, you know, one rose for Rosa. And he, he um, hired a limousine, because this was a big deal. And, and it was a fabulous graduation. Everybody just roared to, 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 you know, to meet her. They were just so excited. And on the limousine ride back, he started teasing her. He said, Miss Parks, tell me something about that day on the bus. And she started to speak. He said, wait, 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 Mrs. Parks. Whatever you tell me, I'm gonna tell my grandchildren. So tell me, to think about it, cause you know, it's gonna go down through my family. And she said, well, Professor, and he cut her off again. And she said, he said, uh, you didn't think long enough. I want you to be sure. And she's a very even-tempered woman, but she got a little annoyed. And she said, well, if you let me, I'll tell you something that you don't know. And uh, so he got quiet. And she said the name of the bus driver was James Blake. And that shocked him because his name is James Blake. And he, um, he was embarrassed because he's a self-declaimed uh, black history scholar. And so he said, well, I tell you what, that, that James Blake put you off the bus, but I am going to have a limousine for you whenever you come to New York. So that's how the friendship started. And we, um, of course, I had to keep, make good on the promise, but we spent many wonderful hours at the uh at LaGuardia Airport, believe it, <laughs> uh, with Miss Steele and, and Miss Parks. 
and th that the friendship deepened uh, and uh, she, she started coming to our home and uh, it was a relaxing atmosphere and we could sit and talk. Um, and I started asking her questions. I said, Mrs. Sparks, when, when I look through pictures about the marches, I don't see you. Did you work behind the scenes? And she said, no, I didn't. I was marching. She said, I started at the front of the line, but they kept pushing me onto the shoulders. And after a while, someone would come back and get me and bring me back to the front. And um, that kept happening. And so she said, so I just kind of stayed in, stayed in the background, but I marched. And then I wanted to know, well, I've seen pictures of you at the signing of the Voting Rights Act, but I didn't see pictures of you at the signing of the 1964 Civil Rights Movement. I mean, uh, you know, the signing of the bill. And she said, well, I wasn't invited in her usual calm, nonchalant way. And I was thinking, oh, the mother of the civil rights movement wasn't invited. I mean, the one who sparked the movement. And she responded. She said, it's not, you know, I, 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 I'm not concerned about being at a ceremony, of being at, in a photograph. She says, the important thing is that we are moving forward. And I thought, well, when, whenever we, whatever we're doing, that is a good attitude to have. We, we dedicated uh, our campus in Harlem in the name of Rosa Parks, and everybody wore that, this button. And she fell in love with them. And she used to call me and say, Dr. Blake, I need more buttons. Or Elaine, her, her hey, we need more buttons. They became a collectible item. So usually during Black History Month and Women's History Month, I pull out my Rosa Parks button. And I gave out a few at PS 98. <laughs> I love the button. This is incredible. <laughs> OK. And then if I, um, I met uh, Elaine, was um, Elaine met Mrs. Parks when she was 16 years old. And Mrs. Parks referred, Mrs. Parks, as you know, didn't have children and this was her daughter. She would always say, well, Elaine is like a daughter to me. And so they, they were together from the time she was, Elaine was 16 until uh, Mrs. Parks passing. And then my husband and um, Elaine and Mrs. Parks and I spent lots of time in airports. And I got a chance to travel with her around the country um, and to Mexico because she was trying to start an international um, uh, well, she, they established the Rosa and Raymond Parks Institute for Self-Development. Elaine and Mrs. Parks co-founded it in honor of her husband, who was an activist. <laughs> and, but he uh, is it, just a man that I have a great deal of respect for because he gave up his job as um, a barber. And if you know anything about the black community, you know, the barbers, that's the center, the, the place where black men can go and just be themselves, you know. And so he, he, he was a leader working to free the Scottsboro boys in the 30s. And so Mrs. Parks wanted his name to be up front so people would always, they would, it wouldn't become the Rosa Parks Institute, but it's the Raymond and Rosa Parks Institute. So uh, it was quite a love story. And this is at the, at, we, we were at home uh, at my house in Queens and we cooked together and we would sit around and chat about Montgomery and the civil rights movement and, um, 
you know, she would answer questions like, you know, why wasn't she at the front of the line in some of those pictures or why wasn't she at the uh, signing of the, the civil rights bill? And of course, uh, she, her legacy is passed on to Cecilia's child and to my child. <laughs> and then Mr. Blake has two sons and he's passing the legacy on to them. So we all love Rosa Parks. Uh, she was a humble woman. And I've heard her do many, you know, speeches. And, and I had wanted to have a snippet today, but I just have to learn the technology. But she, did, she didn't talk about herself, and she wasn't trying to get a spot in the sun. It was uh, Miss Steele and people who loved her who encouraged her to tell her story. And I recommend to your audience, read Rosa Parks, my story, because it's in her own words, and it's a fine piece of, of history. And while I'm recommending, you know, I'm an English teacher. While I'm recommending books, Quiet Strength is another Rosa Parks uh, public book that, that you'll enjoy reading. It's about her spiritual journey and how where she gets her strength from. Um, she was um, a deaconess in her church. Can you imagine coming into the church? She served as usher and being ushered to your seat by Rosa Parks. Uh, she volunteered in her community, in nursing homes, and she, she was just a re remarkable woman. And she didn't stop in Montgomery. Uh, she, yeah, something for the children. So, uh, I Am Rosa Parks. It's a great book for children. So, I got my English thing out of the way. <laughs> Uh, the Rose and Raymond Parks Institute for Self Development had, had still has um, a premier program called Pathways to Freedom. When I was on the on the board of directors of the institute, they they allowed me to name it Pathways to Freedom. But the program followed the route of the Underground Railroad and the um, Freedom Riders, and groups of diverse students from all over the country loaded on a bus with Mrs. Parks, Ms. Steele, and some other volunteers. And they traveled these routes into Canada and down into the Deep South. And they were able to talk with other uh, history makers and to witness Mrs. Parks interacting with them. She wanted to do this because she wanted to she saw children as our futures. As a matter of fact, she said that next to the December 1st stance that she took, she wants most to be remembered for the work that she um, did with children. And her work didn't stop with the Youth Council of the NAACP, where she took young people you know, on marches to the library, the segregated library. It continued in Detroit, and uh, and and I have that love for children. It's one of the reasons I love her. She's always wants to be around young people, and to she says that's the way we ensure our future. So that day on the bus. Uh, is our legacy. It's mine, it's yours, it's Cecilia's daughter, and I am thinking about a kindergartner at PS 98 where someone told her, oh, you're too young to understand what Dr. Blake is talking about. And she says, yes, 
I understand. Rosa Parks changed the rules. And so that's why I love Rosa Parks. She changed the rules. I, I love that story so much, um, Dr. Blake. And, and, and I think the, the moment in the Mongo bar, uh, the Mongo Mary bus boycott is something that she's really prominently known for. And I know she, and you talked a lot about this. She challenged, you know, racial violence, prejudice systems in numerous ways. She was also part of the, um, NAACP and was one of the two women in the chapter, became an electric secretary for the chapter. And she, in, in that role, served um, numerous public responses to multiple prominent criminal and civil cases. Can you talk a little bit more about, you know, and you started to about what she was beyond that moment and the how much of a skilled strategist she was and how brilliant she was. Do you mind just talking a little bit about that time and the work that was happening? Well, um, I, I, I really, I don't feel qualified to talk about that because I was, when Rosa Parks was taking her, making her stance and doing the work, she, I think I was, I must have been between 10 and 14 years old. And when I was with her, she, in her speeches, she very rarely talked about herself. She was always lifting someone up. She was saying, well, now you know, you know about Joanne Robinson, don't you? She was the school teacher who got all those notices out. Uh, Fatima Clark, she talked a lot about her, or her best friend, um, Johnny, Johnny Carr, or about the Durs, the attorney and the woman she would, was, would sew for. But she didn't talk about herself. She was, she was so humble. She was always saying, but there were others. There were many others. And so I... I I didn't have a first-hand hand knowledge. I, I do know um, about the climate that she was working in because I grew up in that climate. Uh, it, was, it was very difficult. It was like being in a war zone. And you, there was no, no uh, well, you just didn't feel safe, whether you were at home or in the streets or on the streets or at church that there was not there was danger it was a dangerous climate and sad to say that there, there are communities now right here in new york city that feel that way uh you know where as a young person i, I didn't i i felt sometimes anger and sometimes frightened because of vile words that were hurled at me or angry because somebody called my father boy and my and my mother gal um, that's yeah so sad or or someone being used as someone else's sport in play, you know, being heckled, uh, having dogs sit on you, that, that sort of thing. Um, people disappearing. I mean, that, you know, I, I don't know. Well, I think with all the, the media we have today, people realize that when Rosa Parks refused to give up her, her seat, there was really, there was a really, her life was in danger. Absolutely. And as you said before, we have a long way to go. Yeah. You'll be, um, so what individual steps do you think need to be taken, taken for full equality and social justice to be reached, um, to be reached in this country and in the world? Individual steps? Um, well, I, I think we really have to, and we talked about it earlier, to slow down. Um, 
you know, the pace is so fast that we forget what's important, as you've said. Um, we need to listen to one another. You know, we're in these, these uh, si silos, so all of us can take some responsibility for being critical listeners. I mean, really listening to one another. Um, it makes me think about the January 6th situation at the Capitol. You know, we, we, we're not talking to one another. And I think as individuals, we, if we took the courage and get out of our comfort zone, like, you know, doing a Zoom is not my comfort zone, but I think the dialogue is worth it. How else are we gonna to get to know one another and, and get to care about one another? So as an individual, we can, we can do more reaching out. 100%. What is it gonna hurt you to say hello to me? <laughs> mm -hmm. and you never know who when people are what they're silently going through you know that's that's, right. that's the, right. the catch um it's not something you wear you know um with that you and you brought up you know the events that happened this year and shortly after that event happened we also had you know vp kamala harris become not only the first woman but the first black and south asian um, woman to hold office of vice presidency. What do you think that moment represents, um, given all of the work that we've talked about and the women that we've amplified throughout this conversation? Well, it represents another door open. Uh, when, when she became the vice president, I was very excited. I, it gave me hope. Um, and at the same time, I was excited. It, it was a challenge to all of us. Um, you know, so much is made. I, I, I look forward to a time where we don't have to make such a big deal. You know, let's talk about, you know, her qualifications, her background. But there's so much made about she's a woman, she's a woman, and, and, and she's, you know, a woman of color. And when I was appointed dean at the College of New Rochelle, you know, I was the first African-American and the first woman, although this was a woman's college, to be appointed dean in the 100-year history of the institution. And I was ecstatic to be noted, you know, that it was worthy of note in Jet Magazine, a little black publication. And then I was also sad, why, why is this worthy of note? Why couldn't we be having a conversation that says she is the right person for the job? Not that this is historic because you know, she's African-American or she went to a historically black college or, you, you know. So it, it, it's, it's a hope and it's a reminder, but I do see it as a door opened and there's gonna be young women, other people who are marginalized, little girls who are going to see her in the vice presidency and reach higher. So I think it's fantastic. That's what we're hoping for, right? And yes. for, yes. for next month um, at the center, we do have a series of first but not last. Yes. And oh, that's wonderful. I like that. Thank you, Kathy, for that suggestion. So we'll highlight um, you know, first but not last women. So it's it's nice to learn that you were the first, uh, but not the last uh, okay. dean at, at the college at Rochelle, Sonia Rochelle's okay. College. Um, so to end, and thank you so much for being with us tonight. It's um, 
and such a treasure for our organization to have this interview. Right. And can I just say, God, accept our good friend and talented Cecily Tyson into glory. <laughs> Yes, we yeah. we don't want to say we, we are sorry for your loss. We know that you were you were a close friend of Cecily Tyson, and uh, we know like how important her legacy was. Um, so if we, uh, we were happy to end that um, now. It's an honoring her legacy, and if you want to say any final words to our audience tonight, we'll appreciate. And, yeah, well, I just want to say that um, I think education is, is our key form, and we need uh, education that uh, focuses on some, some education that focuses on citizenship and service and those kinds of things. You know, as we're getting jobs, let's remember to be more human. That's it. I love And thank you so life. much for having me. <laughs> thank you for joining us. You are so incredible. I'm leaving so inspired. I'm feeling, I'm leaving like I've learned more. Mm -hmm. And I, as a young woman in the workplace, as a young woman who has a master's degree, I feel empowered in the education that's been laid before me and all the wonderful women including yourself who've allowed doors to open that i've so easily have walked through and that without women like you and so many that were instrumental in your life have helped us open along the way and as we keep opening them as first to yeah. things to come we hope that we make it a little bit easier for people to walk through doors that weren't previously open the way in which you have and so many others. So we thank yes. you for your service, your dedication, and your vision, because it requires vision beyond provision and resources to do the work that you, your husband, and so many others have dedicated their lives into doing. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>